Bill Clinton signed the U.S.-China Relations Act in October 2000 and paved the way for China to join the World Trade Organization. He argued at the time that by entering the WTO, China would import not only more American products, but also democratic values. Things didn't turn out to be the way he anticipated. America has lost millions of jobs and accumulated a trade deficit of trillions of dollars. In no time, China not only has become even more authoritarian, but also has deeply influenced American society by changing our values from within. What have we done wrong? Hi everyone, welcome to my show, I'm Lei. This video is the first in a four-part series about common misconceptions the West has about China. Please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss one. The West had hoped that by accepting China into the World Trade Organization, the free world could have a positive influence on China, allowing it to become more democratic and open. But what we have seen over the past two decades is just the opposite. China did not, in fact, become more democratic. America became more communistic. In my last video, I mentioned 27 top Western scientists who co-signed a letter published in the journal Lancet to defend the Chinese regime against the Wuhan lab leak theory. These scientists are now in the hot seat as some of their behind-the-scenes maneuvers have become public. A few of them recanted their position. My question is this, how did these accomplished scientists get themselves into such a compromising position at the risk of their reputations and even more importantly, public health? Some of them have had close working relations with China and they are the victims of a misconception, which is to bridge the cultural gap, we should do things the Chinese ways, aka when in Rome, do as the Romans do. When Westerners go to China to do business, many experience cultural shock. The ways the Chinese think, interact, and communicate are all very different. But is it a cultural gap between the East and the West, or is it something else? Traditional values and principles are universal, whether they are Eastern or Western. For example, Confucius taught the five core values of benevolence, justice, propriety, wisdom, and faith. These values have guided the Chinese people for 2,000 years and are universally accepted. However, the Chinese Communist Party systematically destroyed these values when it took over power and replaced them with communist values and ideology, which include class struggle, revolution, and deceit. The communist leaders knew that their ideology was fundamentally at odds with traditional Chinese culture. That's why during the 1960s and 70s, they launched the Cultural Revolution to wipe out traditional Chinese culture. 5,000 years of traditional culture, in fact. So the difference that many Westerners feel when they deal with the Chinese is the difference between a communist society and the free world, not the difference between Eastern and Western cultures. In today's China, it's not easy to survive if you follow the principles Confucius taught because the prevailing culture is communistic. So when people talk about doing things the Chinese way, chances are they're referring to the CCP way. So when Westerners go to China to do business, they try to fit in, bridge the cultural gap, and do things the Chinese way. But actually, they're learning the CCP's way. And the result is that they behave and do things just like the CCP. Let me give you an example. Over seven years from 2006 to 2013, J.P. Morgan Chase hired about 100 children of influential Chinese at the request of regime officials. J.P. Morgan did this as part of its efforts to build relations with China in order to access its market. The hiring, dubbed internally as the Sons and Daughters Program, enabled the company to win business that generated $100 million in revenue. Forbes magazine reported that bankers at JP Morgan created spreadsheets to track the amount of business obtained from the Chinese officials as a result of hiring their children. The spreadsheets were labeled referral hires versus revenue, and no request to enter the Sons and Daughters program was ever denied. This type of hiring practice is common in today's China. Chinese don't find it strange. 
JP Morgan learned it and used it to its advantage. But it is illegal in the U.S. In November 2016, JP Morgan Chase paid $264 million to the U.S. government to settle claims that its hiring practices violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. When in China, do as the Chinese do is exactly the tactic the CCP uses to influence Western business people, scientists, journalists, and even government officials. Once these people have learned the CCP way, they will certainly do things to benefit the CCP, knowingly or unknowingly. Another example is George H.W. Bush, who was one of the very first Western politicians to deal with the Chinese Communist leaders in the 1970s. Bush Sr. was President Gerald Ford's special envoy to China, the de facto ambassador from 1974 to 1975. While in China, he befriended Chinese Communist leaders. However, his China experience and knowledge of the CCP did not help him, the U.S. or the Chinese people. Immediately after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, while the American public and Congress were calling for sanctions against the CCP, Bush, who was president at the time, sent a passionate personal letter to Deng Xiaoping. Deng was the communist leader responsible for the massacre, and in his letter Bush reassured Deng of his friendship and pledged his allegiance. The tone of Bush's letter was almost apologetic when he explained that he was under pressure from the U.S. Congress and had to suspend military sales to China. The actions I took as president could not be avoided. He also said that he tried very hard not to inject myself into China's internal affairs. Bush had learned the CCP's rhetoric of not meddling in China's internal affairs and applied it at that moment. Three weeks after the massacre, Bush secretly sent his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, to China to make sure that U.S.-China relations did not sour over the bloodshed in Tiananmen Square. By the way, you can watch my video, China's Old Friend in the White House, to learn more detail about this history. Bush's approach to the matter was Chinese, but not in the traditional sense. It was in terms of the CCP. Bush indeed dealt with the CCP in a CCP way, but the result was just terrible. He sided with the communist leader and turned against the students who were demanding democracy. If Bush had stuck to his American values and stood firm as an American, as the international community kept pressuring the CCP like it did with South Africa to end apartheid, China might have become a democratic society decades ago, and the world we are in today would be completely different. The West must understand that until the Chinese people revive their traditional culture on a large scale, the prevailing dominant way of doing business in China is the corrupt CCP's way. The more you learn it and try to adapt to it, the more it weakens you, and the chances for you to be corrupted and compromised by the CCP are high. My advice is this. No matter whether you are Americans, Canadians, French, or others, hold on to your own values and principles when dealing with the Chinese, and do not waver. If you want to be culturally sensitive, then follow what Confucius taught 2,000 years ago. Benevolence, justice, propriety, wisdom, and faith. Recognizing these principles will gain you admiration from the Chinese, and that's truly being respectful to China and the Chinese people. I'll be making a series of videos on this topic. Stay tuned and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.